welcome everybody to this ongoing dialogue that we're having. This is our third in a series of webinars about foundation uh, relationships. A key component to successful fundraising, as we know from many other um, types of, of fundraising, uh, we're exploring in this series of, of webinars how important it is and where it integrates in the um, foundation fundraising um, process. So um, I welcome you, and if you've been in the other sessions, that's great. Um, this is ongoing, as I said. If you're new to our series, I'm sure we're going to cover um, the most important components of this side of this uh, of relationship building. So our agenda today is to talk about why make the shift to this kind of focus in your foundation fundraising, how to build a, um, a, a relationship with institutional donors, what it is it that you offer, what is it that they're looking for, and then we'll delve into some details in terms of how you can actually begin to, to build that relationship and how you sustain it over the long term. So I'd just like to give a bit of a context to our discussion today. Um, why, you know, why build a, a fundraising uh, relationship with a foundation? And I think the most important um, part of this is to make this initial shift in our thinking, both as fundraisers and as organizations, those of you who have had sustained success in foundation fundraising know that from the very onset of your fundraising, you need to make this shift from thinking about your uh, foundation fundraising as a transaction with a foundation to thinking of it as a a relationship that you're building with a partner over a, uh, an extended period of time and that a relationship that will last over years, both for you as a fundraiser, wherever it is that you work, and also for your organization um, as a relationship over time. So um, I'm getting some feedback that my voice is low. Um, Fanny, can you help with it? Um, Okay. Well, sorry, uh, folks, just a second. I'm just getting feedback that there, people are having trouble hearing me, so um, I'm going to just play with that a little bit. Okay, you can hear me from me. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going. It seems to have cleared up. And um, if you would turn up your volume on your speakers, and if the problem doesn't clear up, please give me feedback again. So um, where was I? Yeah, so this making this shift. Um, right from the beginning of your foundation fundraising process um, is very, very important. Um, so I wanted to look at what the differences are between a transactional approach to foundations and a relationship partner approach to foundations. So a transaction focus um, really looks at the foundation as a, as a or, or organization or a group of people that you get money from, that they give and you get the money and that um, this is something that is based on, I think, old model of worthiness where charity said, well, we're, do we're doing a cause that's important. We're, we're, there's, what we're trying to do is, is, is worthwhile, and so foundations or donors should give to us. And I'm not taking away from the worthiness of your causes, but I want to mention to you that there are eight, over 85,000 not-for-profits, all worthy, in Canada, they are over 1.5 million not-for-profits, all worthy in um, the U.S. So, how do you um, how do you stand out from that very, very large crowd? Um, and how do you prove that your organization is more worthy than another? Um, I would I would say that 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 that, that would be a, a, a not a good use of your time. So, instead of doing that, um, change the focus change the focus of what it is that you're doing um, in your approach to a uh, uh, foundation and move away from this given, uh, this uh, they give, we get kind of approach. Another um, aspect of the transaction focus is that it has very short-term goals. You just want to get the donation, you just want to get the grant for the program you have happening this year. One, you're just looking at uh, a very short-term uh, goal for a year, for a program, for a certain amount of money. 
Um, the you are part of a, a, a larger crowd, and often this kind of approach is much less successful. And smaller grants, I don't have any documentation of numbers to support that, but that's been my experience, certainly Melissa's experience, and I, I checked in with a lot of people I know in the industry, and, and this is their experience as well, that when you focus on just trying to get uh, money for this year alone, then um, you, uh, you have a tendency to be less successful, and the grants that you get are much, are much smaller. Um, and uh, it's all about the grants. That's all that there is there. There's no um, greater understanding of the foundation. There's no uh, the greater understanding that they have about you as an organization. All of that just doesn't happen um, because it's just very much process-oriented in terms of how you go about approaching them. So when we look at the relationship focus, the well, number one thing that the relationship focus uh, begins with is this, is this knowledge that um, it is very uh, unusual, it's a very unusual structure within foundation fundraising. It's the only kind of fund fundraising you do where you ask somebody for money and they, um, and they don't know you and you don't know them very well. So the first step in the in, in this, this shift is to understand this strange structure and try to mitigate that lack of knowledge of each other as you approach um, them in the, uh, from, the, from the outset of your, of your process. And that you are working together towards a shared goal. So the relationship focus acknowledges that the foundation wants to make social change. They want to impact and see something happen in, um, with a particular population or in a particular community or to change a particular issue and that they have as much as of a vested interest in seeing that change as you do as an organization who's directly focused in on that um, particular change. So um, you're coming together to, to make that difference in the world. You're coming together with a shared objective, a shared vision of how the world could be if but for um, the necessary uh, things that, are, that you're going to provide that are going to make that change. So that's um, the first uh, part of it. it you, uh, the foundation values. Um, that your, what you bring to the table in terms of your actual hands-on uh, work in the community and, and you as their partner value what they bring. And so you're involved with each other. You're vested um, in the programs um, that you are doing in order to uh, bring about the social change that you agree is your mutual goal. So over the time that you're working with them and increasing your knowledge of them, and they in increasing their um, knowledge of you, um, you, you find greater opportunities to work together. This, of course, can lead to other kinds of partnership with them. And Melissa's going to give us some details on how you can work with your foundations in other ways. It can also increase um, your opportunities in terms of other grants where you might pro um, partner uh, on other projects. And also, because the foundations are working in the greater sector, they may even bring other partnerships to you of other not-for-profits or other foundations that are their partners that you could partner is, with as well. So with this increasing knowledge of each other uh, and working together, um, opportunities begin to, to open up. Um, you also have the additional benefit of this partnership, um, of actually leveraging it uh, in order to bring about um, other, other kinds of uh, opportunities as we talked about, as well as because your relationship is very close, um, uh, you have the opportunity to actually discuss with them what it is are their strategic directions, what yours are, and be able to uh, come together uh, and work together uh, in program offerings into the future. So most foundations recognize that the kind of change, the kind of impact that they want to see in, in, in the world is a long-term process. Um, when you're in partnership with them to make those kinds of changes, they see you as a long-term partner, and of course it leads to grants um, over the years uh, where they're working with you towards a particular change. So um, the whole change is from a client and uh, to a client and problem-solving focus 
versus the fundraising purpose. This is another way of putting this idea of a uh, transaction versus a relationship uh, building focus for the for your relationship with the foundations. And your goal really is to build a relationship where you where they know who you are. Um, they like it, what you are doing or what you can do in the future. And you can both see how you can help each other achieve the, the goals, the mutual goals that you have in terms of the change in the world and give each other the trust that solidifies this relationship. And Melissa's going to give us a, a lot of details on how to build that kind of trust and build that kind of a solid relationship. So both bar parties are bringing value to the relationship. The foundation brings money funding. They bring interest and support. They bring other partners. They bring knowledge um, sort of on the helicopter level of the whole, sec whole uh, um, sector or the problem in general. You bring expertise, um, the, the actual implementation of the change, your knowledge of the community, the recipients, and you work directly with them. So both parties. Um, have great value to each other. And this is um, a fundamental switch in approach to foundation fundraising that can um, help you sustain success over many, many years. So I'd just like to um, hand it over to Melissa um, to start to take us into, uh, into some details. Melissa. Thank you, Shadi. Um, as Shadi's mentioned, this is a, a process that involves the whole organization. And it, it to develop the, fund, the process with the funder, it's not just you. You're going to need to work with several other levels of people in your organization. Your organization is going to try to build trust with the foundation between the, your staff, your, whoever's writing the proposals and developing the projects, but also with the program staff. The foundation, the program officer, needs to feel great about your organization's work, about your impact, about your potential, how you can work together. And often that means they need to meet program staff. It's way beyond uh, meeting the CEO and, and, the, and the people who are in charge of raising money. So sometimes providing opportunities to see programs in action is a great way to build that trust. There will also be ongoing discussions where, you, where your interest in the issue overlaps. Um, and during these discussions, you'll be sharing knowledge about how things will be implemented or where there are problems or how to define the problem in the community. They'll be sharing information that they have possibly from other grantees that they have about the solution, how it can work. And there's a, some, sometimes there's this fantastic synergy that arises when you can have these conversations and it actually crafts the proposal, process, the proposal itself, and then it makes the proposal review process much easier because the program officer has been at the table and sees how the project will work, can see, can, can describe it to the board who ultimately has the, um, the approval process for the grants. So having these conversations early as the project is emerging can be tremendously helpful. And you can only do that when you have that relationship already going, when, you, when you've invested some time so they know you and they're willing to come to the table. You're gonna, during the course of this relationship, whether it's one month ahead of the proposal or two years ahead of the proposal, that you and, and the other and the funding organization will develop some jointly de shared language and some concept of, and the goals, how you, you, how you want to talk about them the kinds of change that, that want to, um, you want to bring about. And all of this helps the program officer be a more persuasive advocate. So ultimately, when you prepare the proposal, you translate that, you give that to the program officer, and then that program officer has to defend the idea against other program officers who have similar, you know, they're also coming with their um, applicants or with the grant committee. So to the extent that that relationship is developed, the program officer becomes a more effective advocate because he or she is starting to own the process, be really invested in the process. So you can see this isn't just you calling somebody up and saying, let's have lunch. It's, it's really at an institution level thinking strategically about how you develop this, this relationship with an organization and specific individuals uh, with the program officer in particular. Um, because it's a big commitment, it's going to be most effective use of your time to focus on fairly significant amounts of funding. Now that might be a significant um, amount for your organization. Think about this in proportion to your budget. Um, there's not a threshold where I can say, well, it's over $10,000 or over $100,000. It really matters if it's important to your organization as a, as a percentage of your total funding 
or a percentage of your total um, foundation funding where you invest the amount of time that it takes to, to do this work. And as we discussed um, on the seminar last week, you can also involve other members of your organization, specifically your board, to help get this process started. That's on one of the earlier webinars in this series. So why, why is cultivating institutional donors like major gift prospects? This is something we said last time, and it, it remains true. It's really an important step that you plan the cultivation process, just like you would with a major gift donor. Um, that there be some implementation steps and that everything's documented as you go along. And there's follow through. If, if the organization says it's going to do something, it gets done. It's not just set aside until a later date. So in that, in that way, it's very much like cultivating a major gift prospect, an individual or family that could give a great deal of money. In this case, with the funders in particular, institutional funders, you're often, the organization is initiating contact. It's sometimes the case with major gift proposals, but almost always the case with foundation proposals. So there's some similarities there that you're that you might be starting the, the contact um, rather than the donor calling you. Um, there, this is also true with major gift prospects that you re shape together how the proposal process goes, what the program will emerge like. So the the applicant, you, the nonprofit organization, and the um, funding partner are discussing together what the opportunities are. So that's very similar with uh, institutional donors and major gift prospects, that there's a back and forth, we call it the cultivation phase, project design phase you might call it, uh, where each one takes into consideration the other's ideas and goals. It's all focused on positive change. This might be in the proposal world, it might be a pre-proposal. You know, it might actually, this conversation might start with what a funder requests as a pre-proposal or a short online description. It might not actually be in person as, as it would be for a major gift prospect, but it's still starting the conversation to see the opportunities that you can, that you can pursue together. And then the organization submits a proposal. Now, in many nonprofits, this is where the relationship starts with funders. They don't do the first two steps initiating contact and discussing opportunities together. They just start with submitting a proposal. And frankly, most research shows that it works better if you have the first two steps first. Then it's the foundation's um, obligation to review the proposal, to propose revisions, and you talk about it further um, to, to go ahead. And then you, you as the applicant submit a revised proposal. Sometimes it's the final one. Sometimes you go through a few variations. So we're, we're just adding these two steps at the top where you're initiating contact and you're discussing opportunities together and we're trying to provide a structure for how to do that so that you're not starting in the middle of the process as most um, proposal writers do. That's the blue box where the that's um, where most proposals start. We're really trying to encourage for the very large for you, what's a large proposal for you, to start the process earlier. So where do you even begin? Well it, Shadi mentioned the helicopter view. I talk about forests and trees. So um, start way up high. Think very broadly. What do funders want? Well, in this funding environment, many funders want organizations that are, that are delivering specific impact. We hear it over and over. Strategic funding, impact, results, outcome. You know, funders are really pushing for that. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. In many cases, foundations are saying, we tell you what we want you to achieve. They are setting their own programmatic goals and finding nonprofits that will help them get their goals met. I just met today with a group that was doing that. So the funder is determining the agenda, and the nonprofits are essentially submitting applications to be qualified to be the action arm of that foundation's vision. So um, your job is to use the resources available, including the databases and other materials, to, f to get to know the funder as, as best you can, find out what its strategy is, find out if it's a really good fit for you, and then when you identify what the funder wants, determine if your organization is a good applicant. The kinds of impact that funders are looking for, people are often talking about measurable impact there's a slight tip now toward qualitative results where people's stories, their discussions of their impact, 
um, are, are becoming more uh, accepted. But you're, you're going to need to think about your work in terms of the impact that you have on the people you serve. And even if you're preserving sequoias on the, on the western coast of the United States, you still have an impact for people, and you can talk about it in, in measurable terms. And many funders are really looking at broad visions for societal change. They're, they're you know, reduce recidivism for ex-offenders re-entering society, or increase immunization rates among uh, p people in developing nations. Really big visions. And they're looking for the nonprofit funders to d deliver the services. Um, Shadi and I found a couple foundations, and she's going to talk with you about the next one, um, about how they're using their view to um, change how they're making their, their grants. Great. Thank you, um, Melissa. That's a really great introduction to all of this. And as Melissa was saying, it's so important to look at this broad perspective on the foundation during the cultivation stage of your process and really come to understand the change that they're trying to make. So um, the example I wanted to use for with you today is the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation. This is the second oldest um, foundation in uh, Canada. And um, they um, uh, are focused mainly on, on, on a couple of things, if you can see here. They're wanting to address uh, sorry for the squiggly lines, so, uh, complex social, uh, environmental, and economic challenges um, that face Canadians. And they want to do this with an innovative uh, approaches and solutions. And by strengthening communities um, as well as collaborating. So you can see um, sort of where their main points are here. It's in terms of addressing these three main areas, innovation and solutions, uh, community, uh, strengthening the community, as well as collaborating with partners both in the public, the private sectors, and in the community as well. So it's interesting to look at their granting history over the last couple of years and see how this plays out. When you look at the grants in, the, in terms of the categories, they do indeed show that they have a, um, of, their, of the total number of grants in terms of the amount they give, that 30%, almost 30% of their grants over the last 30 years have gone to education and 15% 15 15 to community development and uh, to the health sector. So it's interesting to see because the health sector wasn't even mentioned in their list of uh, programs that they give to. So why, you know, the, the, the environment, uh, education, community development, those were clear. Why this huge amount to, uh, to health when it isn't even listed as one of the areas? I think the answer to that is the sentence, the, the, the three words here, innovative approaches and solutions. This actually is their greatest area of interest. They want to see age-old problems in our, in our world solved in an innovative way, and they're willing to put their money behind that, uh, any kind of change that they see. They also have a huge percentage, almost 20%, that goes to miscellaneous donations. Again, this is because if they see somebody doing something innovative in their sector, innovative in terms of a solution, they're willing to support that. They have even uh, created programs specific, specifically for giving grants to innovation itself, um, they say that all of their um, all of their grants share a common characteristic in that they are all based on engaging directly with people, learning um, and problem solving, as well as innovating and seeking not simply to solve a problem but to actually make an entire transformation in a system. Um, I was reading a recent article um, about this particular foundation, and they feel so strongly about this, um, this need for innovation, this stance of, of, of the vision they've taken, that they were even willing to go up against, a, I don't know what, I don't know what, I'll just go ahead and call it a bit of a witch hunt that the Canadian government is doing right now, which is trying to uh, reduce the amount of gifts that, um, uh, Canadian uh, not-for-profits get from foreign uh, donors, and they were so felt so strongly about their uh, 
seeking of partners of any kind to make change that they were they that they responded to this this uh, this what's happening in the environment right now, where other organizations, other foundations step away from advocacy work, they actually step up and say, I think that we have been concerned about the fear that people have to speak up and take a position, uh, and they're willing to do that on the behalf of not-for-profit organizations. So you can see that, they're, that their focus on bolstering um, Canadians' ability to make change and to um, and to and to solve complex issues through innovation, um, that they are willing to address this in every way possible. I want to pass the uh, baton back to Melissa and um, ask Melissa. Thanks, Shetty. Um, am I still on the air here? <laughs> um, hello. Yes, you're there, Melissa. You're there, Melissa. Okay. You're, you're there. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a foundation that we've heard a great deal about in the last 13 or 14 years since it was started. And it's one of the first that started this whole strategic focus, at least that I'm aware of. Um, this is from their website. They say that nearly 2.5 billion people live on less than $2 a day. One, more than 1 billion suffer from chronic hunger, so that's roughly one-seventh of the world population. Um, and that their mission is to increase opportunities for people in developing countries um, uh, and to overcome hunger and poverty. Well, and as you're aware, they've done this by focusing on a remarkably uh, significant investments in immunization. They've started to focus on uh, uh, agricultural development for food and um, distribution for food services. They also are looking at high impact, just as Shadi said, that the McConnell Foundation is doing, and sustainable solutions. In their case, they want to reach hundreds of millions of people. So they're, they're putting some numbers behind what they consider high impact. One of the things the Gates Foundation has done, they say they work closely with their partners. In many cases, they've created their partners. They've stimulated the creation of several different initiatives in um, healthcare and in immunization in particular, but in also in other ways, in order to, deliver, to create and to deliver those innovative approaches. And then they expand existing ones as well, um, so that their focus, they've picked a very large problem because they have an immense amount of resources, and they're able to work simultaneously in a strategic way, but also in a focused way, in part because they have such tight connections with either organizations they create and fund or organizations that they fund in the, in the long run. This is a very extreme example of this strategic approach, but part of the reason for going through these is to show you the kinds of words to look at when, when you're looking in the databases or in the foundation descriptions about these are key words. They're interested in partnership. They're interested very much in developing the relationships and in keeping the relationships strong so that your impact can be increased. They're not interested in one-time grants that, um, you, where you deliver modest services. So when you think about the forest and what your organizations offer, think about not only what your foundations want, but think about what you offer. So you need to be able to show the funder what your impact is. Usually even bef as you, before you've submitted a proposal, you need to be able to talk about your organization's strategic impact. So you need to know what you do, how you're going to meet their needs. Your, uh, part of your conversation is establishing the relationship. Is We know you're interested in developing agricultural resources to help food crops survive in, in African, uh, tropical African countries. If you know that's what you can do, then you can talk to the Gates Foundation about how you're going to help them meet their goal to reduce hunger in developing nations in the continent of Africa. You need to know how your organization measures your impact. That will come up. Strategic funders want to know how you're measuring and what you're measuring. So that's part of the conversation that you will have or your CEO will have, possibly even a board member, about how your organization does its work. And you're also going to be able to match the ways that you describe your impact to what the funder says it wants. So going back to the McConnell Foundation, if they say that they want innovative solutions, in the words that are used in describing your organization's impact, you're going to show how your organization is innovative. You're going to show how the solutions are innovative. You might even describe the process of getting to those solutions because they have some very clear ways about how they like to work with the communities who are affected by their grant making. So that's all part of this planning and implementation process, to know what you, what you can do, 
know where it overlaps with the funder, and know how to talk about it in the funder's own words, the funder's own terms. Of course, strategic grant making is not the only reason that funders make grants. It's, it's probably not the predominant reason. It is, however, one that is growing in impact, and funders are talking with each other all the time about how to do it. But let's look at some of the others. There are definitely funders that are interested in supporting research and development in the nonprofit sector. They're willing to take the risk on new ideas as you explore new ways to deliver services. The McConnell Foundation would be an example of looking for innovative approaches to long-term problems. And they're going to want research and to test to see whether your ideas actually work at, at addressing the problem in a more successful way than whatever exists now. So look for funders that are interested in exploring some of those innovative approaches, and that's perfectly fine. There are funders that are interested in simply offering working capital. They might call it seed funding or pilot programs or something like that. But they, are, they also are interested in, in helping non, um, nonprofits test new ideas to solve long-term problems. Some funders recognize that they are sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval in their communities. And they realize that you might be seeking a grant from them because that will help you build on um, that leverage that Shetty was talking about to be an even more credible um, nonprofit for working with other funders. And you can be very clear with them. And you can say, we know that your engagement in this project is very important to our, our ability to succeed. So how can we work together? Um, and they'll, you know, community foundations are very good at this. They understand their role in that. And so that's one reason uh, for approaching a funder and, and knowing what they offer and what you want in that relationship. Probably the least uh, compelling reason for a funder to be interested in working with you is if you just have a, a gap to fill in your budget. And sadly, that is how many of us have been trained. We think we can raise this much in the annual fund, and so we'll seek the rest through institutional uh, funders because we know we have to meet this budget goal. And the whole point of this presentation is to help shift from that thinking, which I mean, I'm old enough now, I basically grew up with it, toward this working together on solved problems, uh, to solve shared problems, this community um, impact focus. So thinking in this funding environment, as Shetty mentioned, the large number of nonprofits seeking funding, the uh, fact that so many funders are very interested in this impact, even if your funder hasn't talked about it, it's not, it doesn't hurt to mention that you can help that funder achieve a uh, more clearly stated level of impact if he, uh, that organization grants to you. So what really matters in developing these relationships? You know what they want, you know what you can deliver, and then, and I love this quotation, the best way to have a friend is to be one. That's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. That we have to move away from what Shetty described as the transaction toward the relationship to recognize the value that we bring to the partnership and that we can start the partnership because we know we're putting value on the table through the expertise, through the implementation skills, through the connections that we have in the community, and to invite the funder to be our friend, to come home on a play date with us and um, work with us on solving this problem. So how do we do this specifically in a grant-making relationship? The very first thing is it seems so obvious, but it's the single reason why most proposals are turned down. They haven't met the minimum criteria. So be sure that you know that grant maker's priorities, even though the words they use to talk about their work. Are they interested in innovative approaches or new solutions? And you use those kinds of words, whichever one of those two they use. You use that term. You know what their recent grants uh, look like. Shuddy described McConnell Foundation's grant making, X percent for here, but 33 percent for health, which isn't even on their list. That tells you something about what their interests are and how they're doing their work. So you need to know that kind of information. You get it from the, from the online databases or even from the funders' sites themselves. You need to know the people involved, the program officer. Possibly your board member has a connection with their board member. Maybe somebody on your staff worked 10 years ago with somebody on their staff. Ha know what those connections are so that you can help get access through the existing connections. Be and absolutely, without fail, make sure you meet whatever minimum qualifications they have, whether they're geographical, whether it's the type of entity that you are. In the United States, many foundations will not fund religious congregations, so make sure you're eligible. 
um, make sure they're interested in giving to what you, you support and so forth. Because otherwise, why would you spend the time developing a relationship or developing a proposal if you know already that you won't be eligible? So you've got the background. You have a thought about what the funder does. You know what you can offer. So what do you do first? You follow the rules. This is a case where even though you want a friendship, somebody is uh, in a position to determine what the rules are. So you know what they are and you follow them. You develop a plan. I'm all about planning and knowing each step along the way wh where you want to go and what you think the next step in the process can be. And you consider the right approach to use. This is a communications choice. Um, many funders are very happy to field a genuine question. If you just don't understand something in their materials, you know, give them a call, send an email, and that's what they're there for, and they like to do that. Many welcome opportunities to give advice. So rather than saying, well, we'd like to know if we're eligible for funding, we'd say, well, we're tackling this problem in our community, and we know it's of interest to you. Can, can we get together, and you can tell us what you've learned about working on this project in the last several years, this particular kind of issue in the last several years. So you can um, do take many steps along the way to explore a possible partnership, but the first conversations are not about money. The first conversations are really about the idea, the solution to the problem. So um, you might ask them to review what they're doing, how to, ha how to move the question forward. How, they could ask, ask you for your um, account of where you've been. You could ask for their account of where they've been. You could look for where they intersect. That's one way to have a discussion that's not about specific grant making, asking their advice on the issue. You can ask them to visit your site, or you could ask if you could visit sites they've already funded so that you can learn from their prior experience with grants in a similar uh, topic area. You could invite the funder to your facilities. If they have a meeting or something, it might be appropriate for them to come to if you're a, a, at a place that has a meeting room so that they come to see you without any expectation one side or the other about uh, future funding. It's that if you, to be a friend, act like one. Make gestures, invite them, be open. And then always engage and discuss ideas for the project and that discussion focuses on impact. It's not about, well, we need $50,000 to be able to meet this year's budget goal. No, it's with $50,000, we will be able to serve this many people, do this many things, et cetera. And you, another way to build a relationship is if you've become such a content expert, your organization is recognized as for, for expertise in a certain area, that you become the trusted source for this particular funder. If they have a question about, for example, the newest thing in education and you happen to be involved in education, your organization is the place they'll call. And I've had several funders mention this to me. They like that kind of resource. They like having somebody on their Rolodex or in their phone that, whom they can call when they have questions or concerns about other issues that, issues that come up. So become that source. Share your knowledge. It's not just about the money. It's about how to get the work done and meet the goals. So I talked about the importance of planning. I think you should be planning a year ahead. Now, in a perfect world, we would all have time to do this. Best practices, this would be ideal. You do what you can do given your organization circumstances. If right now you're planning for this week, then see if you can maybe by December start to plan one week ahead. And then by January, maybe you can plan a month ahead and then you back it up a little bit each time. But it, because it takes time to build a friendship or a relationship, you need to allow that kind of cultivation time as part of the process. And you, maybe you work up to it gradually. But do uh, consider ways that your organization can start building relationships ahead of the time you need the money. It makes the entire process much uh, less stressful for everyone and more successful in the long run because you're more likely to, to receive funding when you've done this. When you're actually working on the project, somebody needs to keep in touch with the funder. It might be the program manager who's actually doing the work. It might be somebody in the development office. Somebody needs to keep in touch with the funder, not just because the, you don't drop the friendship just because all of a sudden you're, you're working on the party you're, that you decided to hold together. 
you're going to have to keep in touch and some, making sure that there's somebody on your team who does that is an important part of keeping the relationship going. Otherwise, it looks like it's just about the money. We, we were just friends with you until you gave us the money, and then we don't have time for you anymore. And that's not the right message to send. And you want to keep the relationship going after the project done. This is pot potentially a multi-year commitment on both sides to work toward a shared goal. So whoever is in charge of making sure that the funder is still in the loop, still on the mailing list, still getting invited, still invited to talk with the executive director um, you know, quarterly or something, that's important. It's part of keeping the relationship going, and it should be part of your institutional approach to sustaining relationships with all kinds of donors, not just um, institutional donors, but also major gift donors. To, to build into the uh, relationship-based funding, you need to have people who pay attention to the relationship and not just to the application process and managing the proposal through the, through the review process. So part of this requires knowing a little bit about different funders and their style. Some funders are more formal than others. I say their money, their rules. The quotations are around that because it's my quotation. So um, that there are formal versus informal funders. And so here's an example of an informal funder. In this case, the, the funder says, you know, send your inquiry online or, or phone us. Well, if a telephone inquiry or online inquiry, those are both pretty form informal methods of communication. If somebody doesn't give you their email, you do uh, in their published material, don't send an email. That's not one of their rules. One of their rules is they want to be approached either by telephone or by letter. So if they offer a telephone number, then you call them. If they don't offer a telephone number or an email, then you send them a letter. You do your best to match your communication style to the funder's preferences as best you can divine them from, from the published material. Is the process, is the relationship building a process oriented focus or is it really, you know, based on people and the people you meet? Well, there are clues in the, in the printed material. If they request an online form or an actual letter or even a pre-proposal, that suggests they're pretty focused on process. And they, they have certain hoops that they want their applicants to go through. Um, they feel more comfortable making sure that all the applicants are treated in the same way. And so they ask, they specify how they want um, the process to go. Then there are funders who don't give those kinds of instructions. They just say, to begin the process, contact Vice President XYZ. And that suggests that they're really interested in the relationship first. Um, the process-focused people, it's not that they're not interested in the relationship, it's just that they want the process followed, that you can build a relationship around that. But the people who say, you know, telephone XYZ, they really want that relationship first. So you don't write a proposal first, you call them first, and you start that conversation going um, before you go too far down that road. And then you decide if you're interest, if you can tell if they're interested in short engagement or a long-term view. And you do this by looking at their grant making. Are they offering uh, one-year grants that are one year at a time and they have lots of new grantees? Well, that tells you something about how they view the relationship. They view it as a relatively short commitment. Or are they looking at multi-year grants, or are they giving repeat grants to the same organizations over time? Well, that gives you some clues that they're interested in that long-term relationship nature. And this can also help you figure out where to allocate your resources um, when you're trying to decide, well, who do, we, who do we do this process for? Well, you do it for the ones that are offering multi-year grants and repeat grants to the same organizations. Uh, that's very clear. So then you pick an approach. And you pick the approach that's suited to the funder's style. Again, it's their money, their rules. So you can use an email. Absolutely. It's very common. Funders expect it. It's pretty, pretty, they, many of them publish the email now. And one of the people I've talked with recently says, before you even start emailing, you should link up through Facebook and Twitter and follow the foundation if you can. If they have those kinds of accounts, you should see what they're talking about. See what they're um, discussing, where their interests are. So see if they have, they, it has to be the institutional account, not the individual who works there, and not their personal account for their, for their weekends. So follow that first. If you can, where it's appropriate, on behalf of your organization, you can say, wow, great program. We're you know, really close to something we're doing, or whatever's appropriate. 
um, so that they recognize your organization's name. Why do you want to do this? You want the people who receive your email to already know your organization's name because they're more likely to open your email if they recognize it. Oh yeah, they follow me on Facebook. Oh yeah, I, I see them on Twitter. So you follow and you post as appropriate. Um, and you want the organization name, whatever's at, after the at symbol, to be recognized so that your email message gets opened. Your emails should be short. Almost everybody these days, especially in um, the world of people who travel, are, are reading emails on mobile devices, whether it's a phone or a tablet. So, excuse me, it needs to be short and not no attachments. And you need to show how your nonprofit overlaps and helps the foundation meet its goal. We have a project for you that fits right in with your XYZ initiative, and here's how. Here's the impact that we can have. And you're going to ask for a follow-up call or a message. It's not about getting a meeting. It's not about requesting money. So the email is, is short, and it's very specific about what it wants. And oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the most important thing. The foundation officers I've talked with say you wait two to three weeks before you give up on not hearing from them. You can email again after two to three weeks, but they are so busy that that amount of time is a very reasonable amount of time to, to wait to, for them to be able to get back to you. Two days would not be enough time. So just wait, give it a few weeks before you follow up. If you have to do it by telephone, somebody is going to be making the call and it might not be you. So there should be a script of preparation. And the key point, points again are about the impact, the overlap with the funder's goal, and you request a time to discuss it further. This call should be a peer-to-peer -peer call. So if it, you're calling a program officer, it should be a VP for development, not the intern in your office, not, not the person who's there one day a week, but uh, somebody who's at a fairly high level to talk with the pro program officer. Chances are that the, there will be a phone message. And these are some tips for, right from the foundation officers I've talked with. State your name and phone number first. Then if they miss it the first time, they only have to listen to a part of the message to get it. Again, describe how you help the foundation meet its goals. Not about how you need money, but how you help the foundation meet its goals. And you ask for time um, to, to review the idea and to discuss the idea. And then if you have a simple email, you can leave an email for a reply. But it's, many of us have complex emails, and so then it's best just to leave a phone number, um, unless it's easy to write down and you don't have to spell it all out, that sort of thing. And again, you wait, and they say it for a telephone call, a week, but two to three is better before you decide that nobody's heard you and you're going to try again. There are many times when all you can do is fill out the online form. Remember what I said about Facebook and Twitter. Read everything that they're saying about themselves first. You're going to mirror back the words that they use to talk about their own work. You're going to help your reader recognize your nonprofit before you even start the form. You're going to comment. You, uh, you forward the Facebook posts, whatever. Sometimes it's really tough, but you do all you can to download the questions. I've even had to type them out uh, myself rather than downloading from the, from the forms because the forms are not always user-friendly. But I want to answer the question exactly the way it's worded so I get the actual text of the question. I use a word processing program to prepare a draft, but I do not use any formatting because when I block and copy to load it back onto the system, pretty much that formatting is likely to be lost. Um, most of those posting systems, you just have to upload it and it's straight text. You can't even use extra spaces sometimes. And the first sentence in every section should tell the story. So if there's three paragraphs, first one is how, how we fit your goals, second one is what our impact are. It, when our impacts are, and third one is sort of some concept of our, our proposal. Proposal. So the just every the first sentence is the, the key sentence in each paragraph. So that it's really easy for someone to skim, especially if they're doing it online. And the sentences should be relatively sh short. These are one of my co-authors says the sentences should be 10 to 20 words long. That makes it easier to read, especially if somebody is reviewing things online on a tablet sitting in an airport somewhere. So what do you talk about? 
again, you're focusing on the overlap between the foundation goals. You're talking about ideas. You're not going to talk about our project to do X, Y, Z, where we need this amount of money to reach this many kids. You're, you could ask questions, but be genuine about it. Don't try to use question asking as a way to get in the door. It's not an excuse. You just have to be sincere that you don't understand something. And it's better to have repeat short conversations rather than one long one. Just like you and I, these Cookbook Foundation officers are remarkably busy, and they could fit something in five minutes, and they don't want a 20-minute conversation. So don't overstay your welcome. Okay, so they get your message, and they respond to you, and then they say, okay, now what? Well, you start the conversation going, and you, you've made the contact. Now you need to think about what is this conversation for? Why are we even having this conversation? Well, Melissa and Shuddy said we should. No, that's not why. You want to know how your nonprofit is a perfect fit for that foundation, and you want the conversation to lead to the opportunity for you to submit a proposal, or you want to know why it's not really a good time to apply to this funder right now. And if you can answer that question fairly quickly, then you've saved them and yourself a great deal of time and effort. You've shared with them your goals. They'll know they'll might be able to think of other funders, but you move on. You do not want to string the relationship going because you think they're a great fit, but you can't convince them. If they're not convinced, you need to move on. If if they're intrigued or interested, and we'll talk about that in a second, then you keep going with the conversation. So you can meet in phone or in person to keep to have this conversation go. You're not talking about the money. I've said this several times. You're talking about the ideas for the where your interests intersect. You're going to have talking points ready so that you remember the important things. You might include examples of your recent work or your impact to help present your program in the best possible option. You're probably going to know what other partners you might involve. If it's an education project, it should be you know the school district or whatever. And you might have specific questions. You want a conversation, so it's a good way to ask a question. What do you recommend? Are there similar projects we should look at? Do you have concerns? Do you have suggestions? Ask advice. If you do that, then you can do the emails, the same kind of conversation. It's relatively brief emails. Don't send a list of 12 questions in one email, one or two questions at a time. Remember that people are very busy, so respect their time constraints. And then see what happens next. And what happens next is step C through Y. And the number of these will be determined completely by how the conversation goes. You might be done at step C, or you might go all the way through Y, and you might even get into the second round of the alphabet. So the way, only way, only you will know how far you're going to go. Always the focus is on your work and the impact and the potential for a partnership. And you always ask the funder how they'd like to be engaged. Don't make assumptions. Do they want to come to events? Do they want your newsletters? Do, would they like to come and visit? Would they like you to visit them? Every funder has its own preferences. And there are, there's no way for me to say do this or do that. You can only ask the funder what, what's their preferred method for engagement. Remember, it's plan, implement, document, follow through. So you need to keep track of the key points of exchanges. This is one way I do it that works extremely well for me. I actually print emails into PDF files, and I keep those files in the um, permanent record. They take much less room than a Word document, and they're less likely to be changed. Um, and it, it fixes the um, headers for the emails for the time and date. Um, so that's one option. You can do it in other ways. Uh, your organization probably has contact reports. Um, and possibly uh, samples that it wants for prospect management system. So make sure you follow those rules within your organization. So that remember, it's an institution to institution connection. So you need it to fit your organization's working style. You need to represent the other organization, the funder, in an appropriate way. And the records need to be there in case you, what I say is, get that perfect job and move to Hawaii. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you make any commitments, you need to fulfill those commitments. You want This is building a relationship. The funder needs to know that they can rely on you. And you keep going until you either hear 
gosh, we're really ready for a proposal, or possibly, gosh, this doesn't seem like a good fit for us. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, you know, maybe we need to move on. So one or the other of those. Um, again, don't string it out just because you think it's a good idea. Move on. When they ask for a proposal, the chances that you have one in draft are very high. So it's probably already been developed as part of this process. You're going to follow their rules. I said, I think last week, if they want it on purple paper, they get it on purple paper, however silly that might seem to us. You align, you show how your project aligns with their interests so that there is very clear in the written document, not just in all the conversations you've had. And your written document reflects the discussions that you've had back and forth. To sustain the project long term, you do everything you said you were going to do in the grant agreement. That seems so obvious, but many people forget that there's a grant agreement. The program officers may not even know. Um, so they might not be aware unless you tell them what the grant agreement says that we're going to do. So you, you make sure that the whole team is on board with what that is. And in remember the relationship manager, you even go beyond the agreement. You can ask what the funder wants. You know, Should we talk every month? Should we send you letters more often than uh, the report that we, we owe you at once a year? Uh, usually about once a quarter seems to be about the time that most funders want to hear um, from a grantee that they're very comfortable with that. Something by email or call is always often very good, but they do not want surprises. I've heard several funders tell me, gosh, I found out that the key staff changed on the project and I had no idea until I went to the wrap-up meeting and I, I wish I'd known. So that's really important. <coughs> it's not like they will... Um, Stop funding you. They just need to, you know, they're your partners. So you want to keep your partner informed. And you want to keep the conversation going. And one of the things I do is if I see something that I think a funder might be interested in because it's on our shared topic of interest, I just forward it to them with a comment, you know, that I think they might be might be interested in it. And, um, the, the, again, you think of it as a partnership or a friendship. You're, you're not taking. You're part of the arrangement. You're part of the, the team. And so how do you keep that going in a friendship? How would you keep, keep that going in a, in a professional relationship? Okay, so here are some kinds of conversations, um, some conversational clues. The funder says, that's a great approach. I really think that's interesting. Well, that suggests that they're, they really want to learn more. Tell, tell them something else to keep them interested and engaged. If the, if the funder says, let me talk about this with my boss, my colleagues, or let me research this further, those kinds of words indicate that they're, they're starting to own the idea. They want to share it with others. They want, they want to delve more deeply into it. If they say, what funding sources are you considering, then they're starting to really think about what's our role here. What's, is, there, are there real, is there real money for this? Where, where would that come from? How, what's our, our role? If they say something like, what would it take to get this done? They're really interested in, in the brass tacks of designing the project. They might be interested in what the, what the dollars look like, but they're also interested in sort of the project's plan, um, how many people would be involved, in, how, how would, who would we have to recruit around the table. Those are all good signs. And if they say, this sounds like a really good fit with our initiative, our program, or whatever, then that's a wonderful phrase that sounds like, we are ready for a proposal. And so you follow up with, well, if I submit a proposal, is now a good time um, if you hear, hear words like that. So these, these kinds of statements are all clues that you can move to the next level or you can in, take that as an indication that the funder is interested and wants to keep, keep hearing more. So here's a checklist um, that uh, covers some of the things that we've talked about. We talked about meeting the guidelines. So um, if, you, if you haven't met the guidelines, well, then stop. You're done. And if you have, then you uh, can move on down through the other elements of the checklist. I'm not going to go through them all, but the, uh, w what way do they like to be contacted is clearly on the top. You need to know your own work. You need to figure out the best way to contact. You wait for the responses. Um, you 
follow up, you take that step B, I, I called it down um, to the toward the bottom here. You take step B to show that you um, are um, ready to keep the conversation going. You keep the records, and you then you have the idea of the proposal when invited. So lots of work before actually submitting the proposal itself. So I used a few resources in this, and I'll review them very quickly. Um, I co-wrote with somebody else a manual for the fundraising school, and it's available for people who take the course. Um, and, and sadly, it's not available broadly. Um, a woman named Jane Hexter has just come out with a book called Grant Writing Revealed, 25 Experts Share Their Secrets. It's prepared from the perspective of people who actually write the proposals, but it also includes information about uh, program officers and what they say. And then um, I'm working with um, Foundation Search on having interviewed Foundation program officers, and much of this information is actually from those interviews. So I'm going to turn this back to Shetty um, to do the summary, and then so I can get some water, and then um, help us wrap up with the Q&A. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. That was such great information and, and lots of detail on the how-to. I hope everybody has a sense of really how they can you know, hang up from today's webinar and start to make the steps and moving forward to building relationships. If you have questions on those, and I've been seeing them coming along as uh, Melissa's been talking and, and, and responding, saying that much of what people are asking is in the content of the webinar. If you still have further questions, please feel free to um, start to ask them now. We'll move into the question and answer period. I think um, one remark, uh, just a main a overall remark that I want to make, um, a bit of a follow-up to everything that um, Melissa has been saying all along the line, is that first step of making sure that you actually meet the criteria. This is a lot of work, as you can see, even before you submit your proposal. There's a lot of work in terms of building a relationship. You want to invest your time wisely. So you're not going to do cookie cutter. It's going to be very much individual, tailored to every single foundation, every single program within that foundation and the, and the officers and the board and so on that are attached to that foundation. So make sure that you meet the foundation on at least, uh, I'd say, three levels. One is, do they actually give to programs like yours? Are you in alignment as far as their giving interests go? Um, attached to that, um, that you might not find out at the beginning, but, um, will be, but be looking for it down the line is, not only do they give to your area, or not only are they interested in solving a solution a problem that you're addressing, but do you have similar solution to the problem vision. In other words, are you in alignment in terms of your theory of change? Do you believe that change will happen with a particular sector in one in one way the foundation has a very different way, then again that might as well be a closed door for you um, because they're not going to support your particular approach if it's if it's if it's diametrically opposed to theirs. Um, secondly, um, of course, we talked about geography. Talk about and then give and then geography. Do they actually give to your community or in your state or province or, or town? And um, also, is the amount a match? If they're only giving five hundred thousand dollar gifts and you only need five thousand dollars, then it's not a good use of your time to spend all this time cultivating them when they don't give at your level. If what you're needing is a is a large gift and they give us smaller gifts, then you need to obviously have a lot of foundations who give to that particular uh, area. So do um, you know build it uh, why? so that you are matching uh, in terms of, your, of the level of gifts that you're looking for. So I'd like to open it up now to um, questions. Um, I know that uh, one of the solutions that, uh, sorry, I just mentioned to you that we, this is the, we're just completing the third, and we do have one more webinar, and that is on stewardship. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks, so I hope you'll, you'll join us for that. Um, you can also, from, these website, from this website, see the other recorded um, sessions that we did on the same topic. 
Um, I'm just going to open it up to Q&A. I know it caused a bit of an echo when all of Melissa and myself and Fanny's lines are open, but we do have to have both Melissa and my line open in order for us to do the Q&A, so hopefully the echo, won't, um, the echo won't come back. So I'll ask the questions, Melissa will answer, and if I have anything to add, I'll, I'll add to that. So first question, would you suggest a major uh, gift officer portfolio approach where one has research prospects to match against organization project goals. Melissa? Yeah, I actually think that's a great idea. Um, I would actually like to see major gift officers, proposal writers, and annual fund people working in, in matrix teams um, as, so that really break down the silos. But um, I, I do think that it makes a lot of sense to have a major gift approach. One of the things I used to do is talk to um, program staff and find out what needs they anticipated or what program developments they anticipated in the coming year, um, and then to, to use that portfolio approach to, to find the grant funding as well. And it worked very well. That was decades ago, so I, I can imagine it's only even more effective these days um, to, to have that, that uh, portfolio approach. Great. Um, I don't have anything to add to that. I think it's a great idea. Um, next question, instead of the VP for development, can a director of corporate or foundation relations make the call? Yes, if somebody who is at a director level could definitely contact a, um, a program officer, that would be no problem. It, each, every organization has different titles for people at, at different levels, but somebody who's in charge of the portfolio is what, what I meant. That's a good, good correction, thank you. Okay, next. Can you give us an idea of how long it usually takes to build a viable relationship with a funder going through all of your steps? <laughs> no, because they're people, <laughs> and so all the issues apply. Um, you know, some people are quick to be, make friends, and some people make a little take a little um, more amount of time. That's individual differences. There are institutional differences, and there are there's also workload differences. So I'm sad I, I can't do that. I would allow at least six months and and up to a year. Um, just because people's schedules are so difficult. Yeah, I would agree with that, Melissa. I'd say in your own planning, in your own mind, um, I would give it at least a year. So as Melissa said right at the beginning of her part of the presentation, start planning far in advance. Um, but some relationships will go quicker. Maybe they themselves have, um, you know, they have a need to move something forward much more quickly, and then it will happen faster. Other times, it's a very slow process. Maybe you're bringing to them something that they haven't thought about in the past, and so you've got to do a whole paradigm shift with them. So um, I think not to, um, to plan and be strategic and not set um, boundaries and, l and know that it's a long-term process. That's what I would say to that question. Uh, yeah, next question, I, can you oh, – sorry, Marissa, go ahead. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, can you provide a database of funding organizations with information on area they are interested in? Yeah, and I'll just answer this question real quick. This webinar is being brought to you by Metasoft. Metasoft is um, the developer of a database or a resource called Foundation Search and Big Online. Those are uh, resources where all the foundations are listed both in the U.S. and in Canada on separate databases, and they have analytics in terms of the grants. Um, that have been given in the past, what, who they've gone to, why, you know, what types of grants and all of that. We're not the only ones in the, in the environment who have this. They are or other uh, databases. I suggest you just simply Google um, you know, funding organization lists or foundation lists, uh, uh, databases, something along those lines. We, of course, believe we're best of the breed. Um, but uh, just to let you know that there, there are a number of, 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 of uh, companies that have that kind of resource for you. Uh, next question, how would you suggest that a person, one person, private, private funder, officer, employ your system given time constraints? I think she's asking, um, how do you do all of this if you're just one person? <laughs> um, you, you're very selective. I might try one funder that's a very uh, – would be a new funder who would be a very important relationship to us and see if it works for that particular uh, funder to, to do all of these steps. I would not do it for everybody. I wouldn't even do it for the majority. I would just pick one test case, if you will, and see, see how to fit it in. You can also, one of the questions somebody sent to me directly was, how do you transfer the relationship from one staff member to another? 
So say the CEO starts the, the relationship and you need to move it to a development director. So you would do that. You would say, you know, say your board member gets involved first and then, gee, I'd really like to, to have Amy over here help me with this. Let me introduce you to her um, so that it isn't all falling on you. See if you can, can recruit somebody uh, possibly in a different even role in the organization to help with the relationship. Um, those would be two strategies I would suggest, strategic choice and then uh, recruiting some help to, to help with relationship management. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, about the resources we mentioned. One is that you know, the 24 foundation program officers as part of Melissa's research that she's doing, that's something she's doing for our company, Metasoft, and um, we're going to be providing a, she's going to provide a paper on that that she's writing with her research partner um, of the results of that, and we will let you know what, uh, how that will be available to you um, in the future. Just uh, stay tuned. Um, next question, um, foundation funding is all about relationships, but if you have tried every avenue you can think of and there is no way to get any inroads, is it just a waste of time to submit an application or do you submit an application because it's still something, so small possibility? Um, if there is no way for you to get an inroad, there is probably no way for anybody else to get an inroad. So as long as they don't say no proposals accepted, by all means, submit an application. That seems to be their preference for how to make those contacts. They might be a foundation that just doesn't want connections, um, and they certainly exist. So um, I wouldn't take that as a discouraging sign. I would, I would take it as a signal that that's how they operate, their money, their rules. Right. Um, somebody's asking, can you elaborate, Melissa, more on how you plan a year ahead? What activities do we have to do? Um, well, the first activity is to know what you're raising money for, um, and that's usually part of the strategic plan of the organization. Sometimes it's at a department. I've worked in very big organizations, so strategic plans at different departments to have ideas about what's coming up. And then I start doing prospect research. I happen to use uh, a database made available by Metasoft um, to do that, to identify some funders. Then I try to see where we, we have connections with those funders, if there is with a um, board member or staff member, and I try to get the conversation started usually within a couple months of when I figure out that we need funding for, let's say, expanding a daycare. Um, and then I have an elaborate calendar system with lots of color codes to keep myself on track about moving each one of those relationships forward. Um, I really like computers <laughs> for, for helping me with that kind of thing. Um, so it's... Um, uh, the big thing is to find the, the projects where we need the money and then prospect for funders and then figure out what the best plan is for each funder. Once I've figured that out, it's actually fairly easy to manage because it's just reminding people they said they'd do this or this needs to happen or, or whatever the next step is. Yeah, I would, I would add um, in that strategic planning that Melissa um, is talking about, I would um, drill deeply into developing your case for support. You're going to get your whole organization behind it. Um, the case for support is an internal document that you're creating where you're very clearly articulating what your purpose is, and you're doing that based on a very clear understanding of the need, and that need is compelling within our community. You're really clear on what the problem is. You're really clear on what will happen in that community or to that population if there's no intervention. You're proposing as an organization to intervene in this situation or to fill a gap in service that is needed, and you're very clear and, and very powerful in your, in your presentation of that in this process that you go through as a case for support. Knowing that, then I would then do your research, as Melissa said, and I would do research from a couple of angles. One, I would research, you know, simply to find prospective uh, foundations that would give to you, but I would also just look at the whole sector. What are foundations interested in in general? What's the, they are all often trends and fashions happening in various sectors. Now, for example, let's say you're a youth organization. What are foundations interested in giving to in youth these days? Are they interested in prevention? Are they interested in working with at-risk youth? Are they more interested in excellence? What is it that foundations are focusing on in your sector right now? And get a real sense of the, 
of the land. This is not just the helicopter view. This is, I'd say, the jet view, you know, really quite high overall in your sector with foundations. And then you start to drill down into the perspective foundation and make sure you are meeting the, the, them on the criteria that we gave you in terms of giving interest, geography, matching um, their, uh, the amounts that they, they give to and all of that. That'll bring you down even uh, smaller groups. And I would suggest to organizations, encourage you to really prioritize all your programs. They're not all of them are foundation fundable. Some of them would be better to go to private donations or, or the government or a corporation. So having gone through a process of looking at the foundation environment for your sector, you can then go back and prioritize the programs that are the most likely to get funded by a foundation and focus there. This is, um, this, you know, the, we all are short of time, and this is one of the ways to really plan in a way that will have you using your time in the best way. And, you know, as a friend of mine used to say, put your spoon where the soup is. What are foundations interested in giving to? Of all the things that you're doing, focus there. Um, next question. The questions about establishing initial relationship with foundations have not really been uh, covered in content. You, uh, you covered how to develop current relationships, but not ways to get foundations to respond so you begin a relationship. So, um, Melissa, um, can you address this for us, please? Sure. And, and the, the foundations have different rules. Each foundation has ways that it will work and ways that it won't work. So if they publish anything about how they like to be contacted, if they publish their emails or their telephone, then I would use that as the way to start the relationship. Um, and I would talk about where the um, program that I'm offering actually meets the foundation's goals. Not what the foundation can do to meet my goals, but to say, I'll just use an example where a friend of mine works, the Kresge Foundation is really interested in uh, promoting access to higher education. We have a great program for that. It says X, Y, Z. Here's what the impact is. I'd really like to talk to you about our shared interests. I'd do that either in an email or a telephone call if I could and see what happens. And as I said, you can wait a couple weeks before you get a response. Some people say that's too long, but that's, that's what program officers tell me is a reasonable amount of time. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll get a response sooner. And then if, if I get a response, then I know if they're interested or if they're not interested. There are some foundations who don't publish their emails, who don't publish their telephone numbers. In those cases, I would write a letter. And I would not say, gee, we're doing this project. Are you interested in our project? I would say, I notice you're funding work in whatever it is, and we think we have a great project idea for you. We'd love a chance to talk. Um, and then invite them to get back in touch with us. This does not work with foundations that are not interested in receiving unsolicited proposals. If they say no unsolicited proposals, then your, your best avenue is through a board member or somebody who knows that foundation already. It's not a staff function. It's really... Um, getting to know the people involved in the foundation so that they become aware of your organization. But the other um, types of contact, telephone, email, or letter, can be done by staff, should be done by staff in many cases. And you, you just start the conversation by focusing on what the foundation is interested in and how you meet its goal. Shadi, would you add more to that? Uh, no, I think you've answered that question really well. Um, the next one is how many potential funders Corporations, foundations, do you recommend to be on a grant officer's portfolio at any one time? I think this is the question here is similar to the rule of thumb, you know, with uh, major gifts. Uh, I think the, the general rule of thumb is somewhere around 100 that a, that a major gifts officer can answer, handle at a time in terms of prospects, uh, 100 to 150, I guess. What would you say that number is um, in terms of foundation? Well, I've been really lucky. I've never had to manage more than 30 at once. Um, and that's in some phase of development, either cultivation, actual project design, or going through the proposal review submission process and the questions and things that come up with that. So um, my experience has been 30, but that, that doesn't mean that's the rule. I don't know that there, there is a, a standard rule. 100 seems like a lot to me because a lot of yeah. times I'm not doing the actual work. I'm staffing somebody else volunteer to do the work or maybe a, a colleague elsewhere in the organization. And um, so there's sort of two steps removed, and that just you have to allow time for that and practice and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I and I wasn't using the hundred for for um, or 
uh, foundation fundraising. I was using that for individual uh, no, major gifts. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't know if there's a hard and fast number, Melissa. I'm in agreement with you. I, I think it's about you looking at your own time. How much time can you spend to this? Um, I would suggest, uh, and Melissa, let me know what you think, um, 10 to 20 percent, somewhere in there, in terms of your overall um, contributed income mix, would come from foundations. It's great money because it's very stable if you've gone to the trouble of building a strong relationship. But um, it's usually not the biggest part of your mix, though a significant uh, contributor. So, you know, utilizing that kind of uh, number, then I think you need to parse out your time based on, on, on that. Melissa, would you? Yes, I would agree with that. that. And in fact, you know, in the U.S., nationally, 75% of the money comes from individuals. And mm -hmm. even if you take out the cont individual contributions to congregations, it's 65% of the money that goes to secular charities comes from individuals. Um, so in the fundraising, if you talk about rewards to um, to effort, then 35% of the organization's fundraising effort should be spent on things other than than living individuals. So that 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 helps decide the allocation of time, especially the person who is in one person and one person. Uh, fundraising plan. Right, right. Okay, great. I think that I hope that answers it for the person. Um, another question: If you submit a proposal online or without a specific contact, and you are not successful, how can you go about getting feedback as to why? Uh, <laughs> that's really difficult. Um, the, this is where you kind of get a little crafty, and you call it. Uh, what I've done is call the receptionist. At the uh, the main number at the foundation and say um, I'd not, I'd like to know if there's somebody I could talk with about my um, some, you know the proposal that that wasn't funded and that is, that person's job is to answer questions like that it, she or he might say no there isn't but um, if if the foundation's being responsive to applicants which many are trying to do more of then it's it's likely you'll be shunted to an intern or an assistant but you you can try to get feedback that way. Foundations are right, trying to right. manage their workload. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, next question. Um, this is someone from Idaho who says they are very limited in a number of foundations. What is um, our advice on identifying and creating a relationship with out-of-state funders? Um, if there are out-of-state funders that fund in Idaho, and I know ways to find that out on maps that are made available on products like Foundation Search, then by all means. If they're a funder that has never made a grant in Idaho before, then no, I wouldn't go there. Um, but there, there are funders in other parts of the country who are interested in Idaho. Some people have second homes there um, and have created foundations that, that make grants in the region. So it, try to find out if their grant making includes your state, even if they're not located there. Right. One of the great ways to do that, particularly with corporations, um, and foundations that are associated with corporations is to look at the size of the employees or some reason for a business interest in your state, even though they may not um, they may not be located there as a head office, as Melissa said. So if they have a lot of staff, or they're they're taking a resource from your um, from that particular state, or, or so forth. Um, for example, I was working with an organization with, which was in an area that didn't have a lot of foundations, but they were one of the world's great resources for bauxite, which is an important ingredient in aluminum. So you could go to all the aluminum companies because clearly they care about, um, you know, working with the populations where what they need is being, is the communities there being impacted by what they're doing. So that's a great way mm -hmm. to find either out of state or, or, or um, other areas in terms of foundation. Um, next question, is it true one should ask for low amounts the first time out regardless or okay to ask for, let's say, 10% lower than their average gift for the first time out or ask for, let's say, um, 300000 uh, or so depending on one size of, your non of the not-for-profit? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of factors in there. I, I advocate that you find out what their median, not the average, the median is for grants in your subject area. So it's not just all grant making that they do, but it's focused on the kind of work you do. And then I do say go below the median. It could be $1 below the median, but it should be on the, on the half of the grants that are less than the midpoint. Um, 
but I don't use the average because that could include a grant made to an organization that they've been working with for 10 years, and it'll be it'll really skew the average. Great. Um, I, what I really like about this question is the person is really focusing on the foundation and what the foundation is doing, and I just want to highlight that and say this is exactly how you want to go about it. You don't want to look and say, well, what do I need? You want to look at the foundation and say, what do they want to give? How, are, how, how much do they want to invest in this particular um, uh, issue or how much they want to invest with this particular population and start to look at uh, at that and then um, you know if you have a goal uh, let's say of fifty thousand dollars know that you may not get all the money from you know one foundation you may be asking a lot of foundations most foundations are going to say no let's be frank right so you're going to have a great this is in prospecting this is not with you know known known foundations that you have built relationships over time with. Um, so you're going to ask for a lot more money than you actually need to raise and know that it's going to come from a number of different sources and not just one, but use their criteria, use their interests as a way to determine what you're going to ask them for. The next question is how, oh, we're just coming up to the half hour here. Melissa and I are going to stay online and answer all of the questions. Um, but I know a number of people are wanting to jump off uh, the session now. They only plan to be on for an hour and a half. So I just want to just complete um, with, with everybody, and then we'll, Melissa and I will stay online and make sure all the questions get answered so that you will have them on your recording. So thank you very, very much for uh, joining us uh, today. The slides will be sent to you as well as a recording of this, um, of this presentation. Uh, there were a couple of things that people have asked for sources. Um, we'll add that to the email as well. And um, you know, uh, I hope that it's been fruitful for you and that you've learned things that you can use immediately for your organization and to drive your goals forward. Please do um, take the time to give us feedback on the webinar. We really appreciate it. Uh, we do have other webinars that we've done um, in terms of skills development and so forth. And if you go to these websites, um, you can find out what those are and um, get them as recordings. So just to go back uh, to the Q&A um, and, and continue answering questions. The next one is, how do you develop that deeper relation, partnership, type of relationship, when your organization does not fit their criteria, their priorities, funding is awarded to similar initiatives, et cetera, yet you do not already have a close relationship with a program officer. I just want to say, first of all, if you do not fit their criteria, this is a no-go. Don't even move forward. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of their time. Um, so that's like number one. Um, and then if you actually, you know, you don't fit their criteria, but you actually find that they're giving to other organizations like yours, then I would say, Melissa, that's the question you want to ask here. What do you do? They say they don't give to you. You say they say they don't give to your um, to give an area, but you see that they're giving to others that are similar to you. What do you do in that case? I very respectfully say I notice that your grant making is extending into X Y Z. I don't say you you slime bags. You changed your rules and didn't tell anyone. Um, very respectfully, <laughs> <No>. right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see you're extending it to a new program area. I'd be really interested in exploring how we could work together. Um, and it, it's um, it's a fine line because sometimes our emotions are are assailed when we we feel somebody's been unjust. But uh, th that's really not the way it goes. It's probably that somebody brought the idea to their attention, and um, you can do that too. Absolutely. And I also say look for the hidden connection. It may not be that they give to that area. You know, in the example we mm -hmm. gave McConnell um, Foundation here in Canada, um, they did not have health listed as one of their major areas yeah. of gift giving. Um, but because they have such a strong interest in innovation, they gave to organizations that were innovative. They also gave 18% of their gifts went to um, miscellaneous ph philanthropy. A lot of it was education oriented, but it was also, be I think, my take on it, because if somebody came to them with an interesting, innovative idea, they were willing to go there. So look for the hidden connection to their criteria. They're probably not going that far off in order to make their gift. They're just finding a new way towards the vision that they have for our, for our community. Uh, next question, how many potential funders, oh, 
I think we answered this question. I don't know why it keeps coming up. Um, um, next question. Ideally, it should be a be peer to peer communications. But what are some strategies if the assistant uh, is making the initial contact and then passing it off to the fund development director? So I think in this case, the person is asking if I have my assistant call the foundation and then pass it to me, how do you do that? I've never had an assistant. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I thought when I read that question too. Sorry to laugh, um, but um, I, I, <laughs> no, it's it, it's just like anything else. You know, the assistant makes calls for other reasons, so it, it's going to be just like anything else. You know, Melissa Brown is fund development director here. She'd really like to talk with somebody about you. You give your assistant the, the script, whatever you think that is. Um, we know you're busy. She's busy. How can we set this up? And then see what happens um, yeah I would agree with that and I would agree and I would also suggest that probably for calls to foundations you probably should keep in your own bailiwick it just if you happen to connect to somebody who's willing to talk to you and then the person has to be passed people don't like to be passed around so my suggestion is do the calls yourself um, and I'm not just saying that because I've never had an assistant either um, next question, do you mean 30 funders at any given time per corporation, foundation, office, or do you mean per institution? Um, I, I think we were saying, uh, you know, even though we were using 30 as a number, uh, you know, it really is up to you in terms of the percentage in your, of, of your budget that you need from foundations, how you allocate, how many foundation, prospective foundations, you're going to work with in order to build a relationship working towards a grant application. And the number 30 is the number that Melissa gave as the highest number she's ever had to work with, with foundations. Uh, sorry, Melissa? At any one time, right. At any one time. So this is basically 30 prospects, if you will. So I hope that answers um, your question, May. Um, next question. Uh, next, uh, question. This topic deserves an entire section. I'm not quite sure what she meant. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. That's all the questions um, that we have. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Um, oh, one more question. Oh, more questions. <laughs> okay, I guess we're staying on the line just a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to say uh, please ask any more questions in the next two minutes, otherwise, and then we're signing off. Um, so uh, next question then. Um, somebody asked about invite-only funders. I think we've responded to that. Uh, if they say they do not want anything um, from an organization that's only by invitation, then you need to find another way to connect to the foundation. It might be through a contact that you have. It might be through shared interest. If you're working on a particular problem, um, perhaps uh, you're going to meet that foundation through your work with other partners in that particular section and so forth. Um, next, you mentioned that it is appropriate for whoever is managing a portfolio to make the initial contact with the program officer. What if this is, the, is a grants manager? Do titles matter? Um, yes, but sometimes we have to, to do what we have to do. Um, and if the grants manager is in charge of seeking and maintaining relationships with funders, then that's that person's job. So um, that that would be the right person to make the call. It's it's just that the program officer might not understand that. So right. Um, I think she's also wondering about. Um, I think part of a question here, Melissa, is. Um, is does it matter the title? Uh, if my title is grant manager, can I be calling a program officer? Does it, do I have to be a, at the director level? Does my title matter in terms of uh, connecting with the with the uh, foundation? Um, yes and no. <laughs> the, the very first part of the conversation, it will. But if you say, "Hi, I'm Megan, and I'm um, in charge of the grants." that we apply for, or I'm in charge of applying for grants on behalf of my organization, then you've established the credibility for why you're making the call. It doesn't matter what the title is. It's the function of the role. So um, maybe that's one reason that it's sometimes nice to be on the phone. You don't have to leave your title at all. You just explain what your function is. Okay, great. 
Um, and I think last question, we've had a couple of questions on invite only. I thought I'd answered it, but we're getting more, so um, let's just add, talk to it again. If it says we only, um, you know, uh, review by invitation, um, how do you go about building a relationship with organizations like that? How, how do you find a way in? You get the webinar that we did last time on working with your board because your best avenue is likely to be one of your volunteers, whether it's a current board member, a past board member, possibly a, a past senior staff member who knows somebody at that foundation or who's connected to the family um, that's running that foundation. And you try to get your organization on that funder's map through those personal connections and not at the staff level. Right. I would agree. And as I said, also uh, to just say, reiterate, um, if you are working in a particular area um, where there's opportunities for networking uh, and so on with other um, not-for-profits, or other people addressing the issue, maybe there's been academic papers being written on it, uh, and so forth, uh, presentations, conferences, all of those are opportunities to interact with foundations. They are also interested in this, uh, having, uh, creating solutions and being part of the solution for that problem in our community. So try and meet them um, at the, at, in those other environments. Um, and, 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 and as um, Melissa said, your initial conversations about how you and they can work together for a solution for the problem, not about money. And as you move the conversation along is when you are um, when you when the money conversation comes up. You um, the part of this uh, last of this question is do we is it worth sending an introductory letter or a letter of inquiry um, if there's absolutely no way that you can connect with an organized uh, foundation and um, this is your only avenue, then yes, um, I would say go ahead and send the, the one maximum two-page letter of inquiry or a letter of introduction, an invitation to a dialogue with them about uh, solutions for the problem that you may be able to help with. Mm -hmm. Melissa, any other comments, last comments, suggestions, tips? Um, again, I want to stress that you don't have to dive into the pool, you know, and go all the way 10 feet down. You can do this a little bit at a time, um, one foundation at a time, one, one um, staff member at a time, and see how it works. Uh, program officers tell us over and over that it works for them, but it also needs to work for you. And you need to be able to adapt some of these procedures to how your organization is set up. So I encourage you to try it. Great. And my last comment would be to remember the value that you both are bringing to a solution for a problem in the community or for a particular population, and to value um, and be able to clearly articulate what your piece of that's going to be, and also to value what the foundation is going to bring, which is more than just money um, they're going to bring to the table. Um, as well, so um, we wish you all the very best in what you're uh, what you're doing and all success in your mission. And uh, we hope that you'll join us again for another webinar. Please remember to fill out the feedback um, after you hang up. And Goodbye, thank you everybody. For hanging on. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.